Today is Friday, March 15th, 2024, and you have found the Living Youth Podcast. I'm here once again with my podcast partner and co-host, Mr. Walsh Smith. Mr. Smith, how are we doing? It's uh, the last 30 minutes of morning. It is. We're in the last 30 minutes of morning. I hope uh, yesterday, March 14th, was Pi Day. Hope you had a great <sighs> Pi Day, I Mr. Robinson. I, I, so I was going through my Gmail mail and... Um, uh, Papa John's had a pie day deal. That was three dollars and forty one cents. Wise, yeah, yeah, marketing. And just to clarify, by the way, we're not like in morning for the next thirty minutes. It's still Friday morning. <laughs> it's Friday <laughs> morning. I guess you should say that, right? <laughs> yes, Friday morning, right? So this 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 um, podcast will be just a little bit different in some ways. Tell them why, Mr. Smith. What do we have on time? All right. Well, what do we have? We don't even know how far we're going to get, but we we received questions from. Many of you at podcast at livingyouth.org. We appreciate those questions. And so many of them build up, and not all of them really are large enough to fill an entire podcast. But we thought it'd be fun to kind of do a, a, a potpourri of questions, just taking a look at a number of the questions that some of y'all have asked and try to just knock up, knock a few out, and see how far we can get. Sounds good. Let's hit it. Let's start. Welcome back. And that is right. We're just going to launch into some questions, some questions that that you listeners have asked that we haven't gotten around to. Some of them are kind of old, actually. I think some we've had really yep. on the list for yep. quite some Several time. Years, yep. And uh, we don't really know how many we're going to be able to get through. We can be long winded at times, but we're going to do our best to, to get through uh, a good a good yep. number. What I think. Could we preview the first three and then really the fourth one is time time dependent? Uh, we can. We could do that. Sure. That, sounds like, like that sounds like a definite maybe. <laughs> well, you'd like to give our, our 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 audience hope that hey, they're going to talk about a question I'm interested in. Uh, that's that's true. That's true. So we we at least plan on getting through three. Okay. So we we, yeah, we think, think we so. do think we can pull that off. And we have we have a pressing date actually at the end of the time yeah. we got to record. So we we've got a hard deadline as well. And then get through more if we have time. Okay. The th- the the first three we really do believe we can get through are uh, why do we begin our services with hymns and prayer? That was been asked. I like that. I like that. Uh, secondly, how should our relationship be with people in the world? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, there's verses that, that uh, definitely have an impact on that. And then third one, I know I, I've, I've answered a lot in the field. I'm, I'm excited to see about this one. I think Mr. Jonathan McNair did a sermon recently. I need to see if it's out. But how to discern God's will. That is, how do we discern God's will? So those are three we think we can... We think we can knock out. If there's time, we can we can go for a fourth. We'll yep, see. Maybe good. fifth, sixth, seventh. Robinson? No, no mm-hmm. you don't. You, you don't. Don't Four. have faith in us. No, I, I don't. <laughs> I think that's a well justified <laughs> lack of faith in that case. All right, let's start with number one. Why do we in the Living Church of God begin services with hymns and prayer? And I do like this one. I, I like. I've, I've, I've had it in the field asked, Hey, why do, why do we do? And it's really part of a larger question. Why do we do services the way we do yep. at all? You don't find a, a commanded order of services in scripture. You can't turn to the book of Hezekiah. It, there's no Hezekiah. Just so you know, you can't turn to the book of Hezekiah and it says thou shalt conduct thy services mm-hmm. in this manner. There must be three songs and then a prayer. And then a sermon. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And yet, You know, we're all about living that Bible life and doing Bible thinking. And so we are going to look to scriptures for guidance in terms of what Mm -hmm. should we do with the service? We don't want to follow just the the patterns of man. We want to understand what what is what is what does God suggest in terms of the examples? Because that's what you want to do, even if the Bible isn't commanding you one way or another at the very least, you want to live your life by the examples of the Bible. You you don't want to just go, oh, there's no command. I'm not bound in any kind of right. way. You want to look for what are the patterns in the Bible? What is the command in the Bible? And what can I, yeah. how can I still allow that to guide me? Well, you know, once again, and this is something that's kind of a repeating theme, like it, it, the middle ground, right? Don't get off in a ditch one way or the other. You know, there's like, well, there's, there's nothing in the Bible, so we could just make up whatever we want. Now, we would not go that far That's because right. we do think there's some principles that are in the Bible that at least guide what we're doing. Yet at the same time, some of what we do is church tradition. 
And I might mention, for example, because a lot of younger um, and maybe even some not so younger listeners may not know even some of the evolution of church services in the church since Mr. Armstrong back in the 40s, frankly. Um, I'll be rusty on some of the details, but I think church used to be three hours, for example, before and, you know, after some time it was, they were cut down to two hours. Um, I know at the feast, they used to have two services every day, not just on the holy days. And then that, that was, so you could say we've been on the track for the latest and era for a while, or you, uh-huh. could, uh, or you could say what I think was, we found a little more balance on it. Yeah. It found what was seen. I mean, you could say if, if, if the equation were simply more time equals more righteous. Mm-hmm. Well, then why isn't it 24 hours, right? Yeah. Why don't you, ma- yeah. well, that's not the case. So yeah. you do want something that is actually a, a, a good, solid amount of time to be effective in all the ways mm-hmm. you want. And so, yeah, by the time I started attending in the late eighties, it was pretty much this. I mean, I think the church had really learned a lot and it kind of settled into what we, yep. what we currently yep. do. I, so for example, during COVID, we temporarily dropped to not singing out loud, but humming. We dropped back from three songs. Did we go to one or two? I honestly can't recall. But it was fewer either way. And I know some people that were really bothered by this. And, and I can definitely understand that because some people, it really means even more to some people than it does to others. And I've just learned that's the case. And that is like, well, we have this tradition. Like I've grown up. We've always sung three songs and changing from three to two feels like, what's happened here? Are we, right. even ha- are we even conducting services correctly? Right. Right. And I know others, uh, who from other countries, it's so easy to just kind of decide, uh, you know, what, what must be quote unquote, based upon your narrow experience versus I know in the council of elders, we'll talk about international experience and we have men and women in different circumstances and have been in different circumstances where, they're literally in a hostile environment Mm -hmm. where they do still want to get together, but you definitely do not call attention to yourself. And in these small, you know, whether whether they're mud huts or whatever Mm -hmm. the case might be, you know, having a rousing congregational hymn is exactly what tells the people with the guns. That's where you are (laughs) to find you. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So that rather what we have is we have authority in the church and that authority in the church looks to the Bible for guidance and then structures services in the way that serves the body of Christ best. And that can vary here and there from moment to moment, but still has a lot of common ingredients. And those ingredients are moved by the Bible in particular, in this case, the example of hymns and prayer in most normal circumstances, you know, we have hymns Mm -hmm. now in some cases where there are some limited circumstances where we have like say a TWP, um, and on a Sabbath, and we're not able to do services before or after, you know, there can be different kinds of circumstances and, you know, we don't sing a hymn in TWPs, but even in cases like that, we like a lot of, at least the ones I'm familiar with, we'll still start with a prayer or something and kind of help the audience recognize, you know, this is something important, but in particular to highlight where we get ideas like the Bible, we did want to take a look at a, yep. a passage yep. in the Bible, you know, before we go, or as we, well, we're going to, we're going to go look at Nehemiah eight where we see, an order of service um, that's not its not as detailed as you might think, yet there's clear principles we can take away from it that you, right. you'll recognize in our structure of service. But as we're headed over there, I want to share my one story, Mr. Okay, Scott. you have a story? Yeah. So um, this is why we won't get through seven or eight this or nine. Is exactly right. <laughs> that's all right. So you know, talk about sometimes the unique circumstances of church mm-hmm. uh, or, or maybe in, in, an, in an international area. And in this case, we went to Kenya for the feast. Mr. Nathan asked if we could go. It was a, a fantastic experience for me and my family. The girls were younger. And there's a couple things that happened on the the last holy day that I'll never forget, which is so in the United States and most of the Western world, the tradition is you we bring our offering as money. You know, write a check or whatever and we collect it. Okay. In Kenya, they're still doing it in part old school. And there was literally I, three animals that were brought as the offering on the last day of Umbra- I wish I could remember what they were. One was a, one I know was one. I remember the story. You remember the story? I just remember one. Well, so, but the, here's the thing that I, so I had the, the sermon for the last great day, but they had, we'd taken up the offering and one of them was a chicken. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so they take the chicken. I'm like fascinated by this and they take the chicken and they put it underneath the lectern. So it's like a tall standing one. Like you don't stand on it but it covers your whole body up, up to you know, the appropriate weight, waist size. And they put this chicken in there. 
and then then they it's just kind of a curtain and so i'm like wow there's a chicken underneath the lectern and so i go up there and at least initially i'm like am i going to get attacked by a chicken <laughs> that i think that's a reasonable thing to wonder about <laughs> turns out if it if they're in the kind of a dark area they tend to be very uh, calm uh, I know there's a farmer out there that's like, man, this guy he doesn't understand chickens. I, I don't. I get it. But I had the unique experience of giving a sermon in Kenya with a live chicken at my feet. So the offering, you know, right sometimes there. you just got to roll. That's with right. Things. That's right. And yet, part of what's neat about that experience is you have those things that are very different than your experience. But overall, it's still a church service mm-hmm. that feels very familiar and very comfortable with brethren who feel very comfortable because they're brothers and sisters. Right, right. And when the other thing, since this is like the order of service kind of question, um, they, they, they didn't have a piano the whole time. So what the song leader would do, which I always felt for the song leader because I've had to do this, um, the song leader has to start off by himself and sings the first line, the first verse, and then everybody comes back. So he's kind of setting the, the, the tone for the song. That, you know, oh, interesting. What, 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 mm-hmm. So we, even now the pianists play a little introduction. So everybody, okay. And he would do that. Then we would sing. And so even, even that part of the song service at least had some alteration to right. account for the circumstances we were in. Right. Right. But we had a song service. Yeah. Oh, that sounds great. All right. Nehemiah 8. Okay. I'm going to, I skipped around a little just to, to, to get the main things, but listen to, so what we're going to read here is in Nehemiah eight, um, you, you have the nation of Israel's come back from, well, Judah, the Jews have come back from captivity and they're, they're getting back on point and they're having, I should have double checked possibly the first really formal feast that they've had in a while. Does that sound about right? And it describes this process of them getting together. And you'll notice a couple things about a, a large area to gather and, and the order of service. And I think, it, I think it's quite, and then you'll see how we, some of what we do to this day is informed by this. So Nehemiah 8 verses 1 through 6. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So that would be the first five books of the Bible. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and women of all those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Uh, So Ezra, the scribe stood on a platform of wood, which they had made for this purpose. And beside him at his right hand was a collection of men's names that we'll skip over. But it appears what they did was they took turns reading. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. And he, uh, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen and Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now, interestingly, there's even a little detail that I think is important about that they weren't just reading straight out of the Bible with no other explanation. Verse 7, also a group of other men. And the Levites helped the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And just two more verses. Skip down to verse 13. Now on the second day, the heads of the Father's house of all the people with the priests and Levites were gathered to Ezra the scribe in order to understand the words of the law. And then finally, verse 18. Also day by day, from the first day until the last day, he read from the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a sacred assembly according to the prescribed manner. So just there very clearly, this was the Feast of Tabernacles on the last great day. And so you might say, where do we get a tradition of having a service every day during the feast, which is technically not commanded except on the holy days, but this is why we do it. No, that's exactly, you know, the last verse really is interesting because it doesn't deny that the eighth day there's a sacred assembly according that is it's commanded in a special way on that day but yet they also had all the other days in between they did meet they recognized it wasn't a holy day 
but they still met exactly. And in, in this account that Mr. Robinson has read, you see a lot of different things that we uh, try to do. In fact, I, I might have missed it. Um, but there is, uh, and, and forgive me if I was distracted by this. Is it raining outside? I hope it yeah, is. Is no, that here? Okay, good. Man, I, I love rain. I got to admit that. Let that distract me. If listen, if we slowly drift off to sleep during our own podcast, it was the rain. <laughs> we'll, we'll go with that. But one, you had the people assembled. Uh, you have the, the Bible being open, right? He had the scrolls. He, you had Ezra reading. And I'm so appreciative that you said that. This idea of the Levites and giving, uh, helping the people understand the sense of it, that's not just a reading mm-hmm. of the Bible, that, or the law specifically. That is making sure the people understand what is being said. That's expounding on what's being said. It's not just this kind of rote, ritualistic, a reading of the Bible and then whatever. No, and so you have their discussion being tied into what they're trying to explain from yeah. the Bible, uh, you, the suggestion of of prayer is interesting. You know, you've noted actually. I'm looking here at Mr. Robinson's wonderful prep notes. Mm-hmm. How there are other examples of assemblies where there does seem to be a prayer whenever God's people are assembled, going back at least to the time of David, if not if not before that. But specifically, you notice how it talked about how the people said Amen. It says that Ezra blessed the Lord. And all the people said, amen and amen. Uh, that does indicate some kind of, you know, official pronouncement. Yep. A, you know, what, what do we do when we start a prayer? We do it just like in, in the model prayer. Yep. We, we start by honoring God, you know, and highlighting him and, and, and being thankful mm-hmm. for what he has done in terms of allowing us to meet. And so you do see that as a part of the as part of the assembly as well. Yeah. I think like if you take take this and and just take out some data points out of it, like a bit of an outline you see that there's clearly an assembling of the people for the purpose of, of hearing instruction. And they pick a place that's big enough to fit everybody. There was preparation because they'd had these raised platforms created ahead of time. The men took term, you know, I think again of the feast specifically, what do we have? We have like, you know, eight elders at least who come up and, you know, give sermons and give sermonettes. And, and that's what we're trying to do is give the sense of things. And I also thought it was very interesting that it goes out of its way to point out that they, that everybody saw very clearly they were reading out of what we would consider the Bible. Like this is not just anything. They it was uh, where was it? Uh, oh yeah, verse five. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. So there's no, there's no confusion about what's being read. This is just clearly the scripture. I think that's kind of interesting. And one of the commentaries um, opines that it seems that. Ezra in this case was anxious to avoid any impression that the law was the private preserve of the religious professional, oh, which is, uh, which I thought was interesting. That is a very interesting observation. But even if they have a slightly different, um, I say format, maybe, um, it's tough for me to conclude anything other than there's sort of, there's what we would think of as a closing prayer and a response by the congregation of amen, which is exactly how we do it these days. So there's a lot there. I mean, what, what, where, where, where I would say, I mean, there's some room in there. What, what is the most holy and righteous number of songs to le- to read? You know, or sing. Sorry, is it three? Is it two? I mean, I've been in services where there's a song after the sermonette, and then another song before the sermon comes up. And the thing is, it's some of it is just. Well, no, in that case, it goes minister by minister. Some minister wanted us one more song after announcements before the sermon. Others don't, don't like that one to go straight into it. And neither is right or wrong. I think is the point. Right. And you know, if you look in context of Nehemiah, the one thing I was, I was looking for to see if there's an explicit reference in Nehemiah eight is the presence of, of singers. Uh, and I don't know that you see them right there in Nehemiah eight, but if you look more broadly in Nehemiah seven, you look all the way to Nehemiah 10, it does mention the singers being a part of the assembly. And so this idea of music being a very appropriate mm-hmm. part of that as well, not to mention the fact that David literally, you know, appointed singers, you know, for the sake of service at the temple. So in answer to the question of why we have, you know, and at the same time, I don't want to make this over complicated or over technical because we don't just do these things just because it's like, okay, we got to have all those things. What about the little details? Like everybody stood when the Bible was open, this and that the Bible is not commanding a particular format, but what we are doing to mention earlier, we're, we're going, we're not just saying, what does God command? We must do. 
and uh, what does he uh, what where he, where he doesn't command? We're just free to be willy nilly. We're look. We're trying to think biblically. We're looking at biblical examples to understand how to pattern things so that things are done decently and in order. And so you see a lot of different elements. Uh, there's other places it talks about uh, worshiping God in in uh, in song in music. There's times when it's people appointed for that. There's times when it, it's the congregation. And as for prayer, honestly, even if it weren't mentioned here. You want to think you're assembling before God. Yep. You're actually you you want to ask His permission to mm-hmm. continue and, and to thank Him for what He's done. It's you would you would naturally like. There's no place in the Bible that commands us to pray before we eat as a family, but the example is yep. there. And when you recognize how dependent you are, <laughs> I've thought about that recently. If I did, if this food didn't keep coming to me every day or so, <laughs> I would die. Yeah, I am very grateful that this food. That I live in a country where that food is available because I I've been doing TWPs and talking about the future famines to come, et cetera. And the more I think of that, that little bit of lunch I have, and I think, man, thank you, God. I still have, I still have food. So why wouldn't you thank God for the opportunity to do that? I really appreciate you saying that because it's funny here. Even again, recently I thought, you know, my dinner prayer is kind of repetitive and you know, it's, I, I all but say the same thing every single time. And then I think, I mean, do you really have to pray before every meal? And then I'm immediately like, are you thankful for every meal? (laughs) (laughs) And and it, it takes you like, 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds to stop and acknowledge before you eat how much you appreciate God taking care of you. Because, you know, I'm on, I'm back on a history podcast again, and I'm reminded we're still relatively in the golden age of, of human existence in terms of um, having plenty. And there was a lot, long, long time periods of humanity where people did not have enough, enough to go around and how thankful you would be. You know, even it reminds me of like Fiddler on the Roof, man. Those, they, they, uh, the Sabbath was very dear to them. And that was like maybe the one time that they brought out something like wine when, you know, the rest of the time they, you know, very, very simple, basic living. And yeah. You appreciated the Sabbath. Yeah. We're thankful to God that you had, had what you needed. So Mr. Robinson, you think we can move on to second question? I think question? we can move on to that. I, I, I like that. I, I have come to find over the years that I feel like that I actually really, because I've thought about it, I really like our our structure of church a lot. It's very compact, though it may not seem like that when you're a kid, mm-hmm. but um, it's got all the elements of worship in there that I think is very important. I'm not a music guy, so I was like, well, what's with all the singing? But, you know, <laughs> like, it's it's right. Um, in fact, um, when I was first giving sermonettes, I was still kind of nervous about it. I would be like, I, I don't have time to be singing, and I would go up there kind of nervous. But then I realized the singing calmed me. Hmm, interesting. And so that I made sure I always, whether I felt like it or not, this is very early in my sermonette career, I would make sure that I sang along the hymn, even if like my heart wasn't into it, because it, it, I, it, I would get there and it would make me feel calmer and I would go up a little less anxious. Um, yeah, so. help, help, help set your mind yep. right, yep. perhaps. Yep. Oh, that, that, that really is interesting. I, Me too. It's been neat. Like when we went, my, Jenny and I went, we're in Brussels, for instance, or... or uh, Charleroi, actually, they're they're in in Belgium. I think it's in Belgium, and and it was just neat that here's a whole room full of people that speak a different language than us, and yet we're all kind of doing the same service. You know, we're still enjoying the same yeah. service and still felt so comfortable and yeah, decently and in order. Uh, the ser- order service has been a real blessing in the church. At the same time, it is not because there's a commanded list. Yeah, and our leaders have a responsibility to try to decide. We could be in some. Yeah, this is, sounds you know, just a fantasy scenario. I don't mean that in a good way. What if we're in some place where honestly you have to keep moving? Uh, in fact, if you stay, you stay in an area longer than an hour, you know, you die. They're hunting for you in the rest. Well, you know what? Then guess, guess what? We're keeping things shorter. You know, we're, we're moving things along. So our leaders have to have the flexibility to, right. to adapt and to respond, but it's always for the sake of serving the same, the same purpose. Yeah. That's a good point because I mean, I know we as humans tend to want things spelled out very clearly and like there's nothing ambiguous about it, but then why even have the principle of binding and loosing it all if the, if the, if the leadership can't have the flexibility to sometimes make a call on a difficult circumstance, like COVID, I think COVID's a great example. Mr. Weston had to make a lot of difficult calls about a lot of things and, um, and not everybody agreed with him, but God gives him the flexibility to make those calls and then it's our job to support it. Yeah. Jesus Christ, and that would be a whole other podcast, but he... He kind of addresses with the Pharisees the attitude of recognizing what these what these things, regulations, laws, but also smaller things, regulations, what they were meant to serve 
versus serving them instead. And so you had the Pharisees debating endlessly about the minutia of whether you can yep. divorce based on something in Deuteronomy and Christ saying, Hey, wait a minute. What, what were all these things meant to protect this sacred thing called marriage? Look at the larger picture. And then you, you understand those things in, in, in proper context and yep. perspective. I was just reading some of that this morning. Were you really awesome? All right. Okay. Second question. So we burned five more minutes on point one because <laughs> we did. We we're not good wrapper uppers, uh, Mr. Robinson. Yeah, we're according to my little clock here. We're about twenty five minutes into our point podcast. four. Is not looking good. It is not looking good. Okay, the second point. Um, how? Oh, no, yeah. How should our relationship uh, be with people in the world? And let me let me interpret this question a bit, and maybe maybe poorly interpreted. I don't know, but you know it's. The, often people in the world generally, they, they don't understand the truth that we have been given to understand. And not only do you have people of different, radically different religions, whether they're Muslim or whether they're uh, atheist, right? Or whether it's a, a Hindu person, it can be a lot of different things, or they're parts of false Christianity, you know, whether it's a different, you know, denomination or strain that really, regardless, we have all these individuals in the world and how do we, how do we, it says, how should, what should our, how should our relationship be? I would take that to mean, how do we relate to them? You know, cause really it's easy to use the word relationship, like it just, a, it is a noun, but to use it as if it is something by itself, like sometimes the word church, sometimes I've, I've tried to make my point about, about how we should be by reminding myself and, and my listeners that, well, the church is the people. And so when we're talking about how the church should be. We're talking about how all of us should be because how all of we are, that determines how the church is. And same thing here. Let's, let's kind of break it down to in terms of how should our relationship be? Well, rather, how should we behave? How should we interact with, with people of the world? And if I were to summarize it, like if we just wanted to, if I wanted to say one thing and can move on, we should be Christian with them. We should love them. You know, we can have friendships, but you know, all of that, as long as our core is what it's supposed to be, that kind of defines those different elements. However, there are multiple verses that interact with this idea of interacting with other people. For instance, um, among them, Romans chapter 12 and starting in verse 18, uh, Ms. Robinson, you kindly have that in our notes. Do you want to go over that one? Sure. Or? Okay. It's so funny. No, I'm not even going to tell that story. Anyway, <laughs> Romans 12, and we'll read verses 18 through 21. So I know it, you, now I'm so curious <laughs> as to what the story is, but we'll have to ignore that. Well, your introduction reminded me of a verse, because you know sometimes you and I will, during the podcast, we'll look up a scripture that we, we thought of. That oh, yeah, I thought of, of another one earlier, right? And I, I thought of the one that we're going to read right now. All right. <laughs> so same page, apparently. <laughs> okay. Um, because I... I, I so Romans twelve eighteen says, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And really we could stop there and, 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 and discuss that for a while. But since the Paul seems to write short little verses, we'll read the other three because it kind of goes on with this idea. Mm, interesting. More. Right. Verse 19, beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath for it is written. Vengeance is mine. I will repay you, says the Lord, you know, very simply. Don't, don't take that kind of thing up into your hands. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Which I just think adds a little more detail to the, the doing your best to live peaceably with all men. You know, that really does. You've, you've, you've actually motivated me to add a few more scriptures. I'll, I'll refer to the end. But uh, it. yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing. Anyway, moving on. Yeah, that is fantastic. Yeah, as much as I love the way Paul qualifies that in verse 18, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. We all know there's some things that don't, that we can't control. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone just truly hates us, well, the only thing in our control is making sure they don't hate us because yep. we're, we're doing something yep. needlessly. You yep. know, you're doing what you can, but that really Paul is trying to put the onus on us. Don't make excuses about other people. What can you do? Do your best to live peaceably with all people. That's that's a, a nice relationship. Is we're not we're not trying to be like like living peaceably with your neighbor. There's your your literal physical neighbor. You know, like like Jesus tried to teach. You know, everybody's kind of our neighbor in the in the sense of the law. But literally, physically, your neighbor next door. As long as there's nothing unsafe. As long as you're not living next to someone you should avoid for safety purposes. 
well, then hopefully you have a good relationship with them. You know, you chat with them whenever, you know, that you're both happen to be out in the yard, you know, mowing or whatever yeah. you're doing. You, you, you wave at them when you're pulling out of your driveway or when they're pulling into theirs and, and build a relationship. There's nothing wrong with that. That's actually everything good yep. about that. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that's a part of living peaceably is not just a matter of keeping your head down. It's a matter of actually being friendly, you know, being, being nice to somebody. We just read from Nehemiah, um, and that's a great example of where their neighbor, their neighbors, the, but this is the larger context of neighbors, um, to, would would not live peaceably with them. Like the mm, other nations um, around them were very unhappy that the Jews were back, that they were rebuilding Jerusalem, that they were repairing the gates and the wall, and um, and eventually working on the temple and getting the altar set up. And, and they hated it and they did everything they could to to fight them against it with all the different tools they had at their disposal. And in that case, you could do nothing about that. You can't live peaceably. So you're right. I that I hadn't thought of it in that detail as much as depends on you. you know, live right. peace, which yeah. which acknowledges that sometimes things are out of your control. Yet at the same time, you do have quite a bit of direct control over it. And, you know, and over the over the years, I've, I've really come to appreciate how important that is and how much you can actually do. You know, you think about difficulties at work with a coworker, maybe, well, you know, there's principles like a soft answer turns away wrath, you know, and this, this right. idea he puts, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Sometimes there's an opportunity where someone's hostile to you and you can be in a position to help them out. And man, that goes a long ways towards reconciling whether you've done something wrong or not is in, in some cases doesn't matter. You know, what you're saying there ties into the kind of the larger picture versus I sort of saved for the end, which is that all this is going to boil down to, you know what, be a Christian right. and then the results will follow yeah. fairly naturally, you know, in that sense. Well, do you remember, I was trying to find the scripture where it basically says if your conduct good enough, even your enemies don't really have anything they can say about you. That's my summary. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. It. You're trying to find that? I'll... I'll Tell you what, I'll look for that one after I throw okay. this one out because this okay. one I think is kind of related to to what you just said, and that's in Galatians chapter six and verse ten. In Galatians six verse ten, Paul recognizes there's there's really two different I hate to say tiers, but two different groups. Really, there's the people who are part of the household of faith, and there's everybody else. But it doesn't mean he says ignore all everybody else. You know, rather he says in verse ten. Therefore, as we have opportunity, there he is again, right? You know, it is not, you can't do everything, but therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. There is a certain priority, right? If someone is your brother or sister in Christ, if they're in the household of faith, then just like someone who is of your household, you know, if you have only, if you have hungry children and you have enough money to feed your two hungry children, there may be two other hungry children down the road, but you know what? You have a priority. You have an obligation to feed your children first. That's not wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's not being privileged or biased or all the kind of weird things people say this day. That is the order that God created in the universe, if you will, that, that you have special obligations to those to that have been assigned to you really by God. And when you're a part of the faith, like we are, uh, our teens and young adults listening as well, then we have a special obligation to those. If we have the opportunity to do good, then then yes, they, they, our first priority does need to be with them. But that is not meant to exclude doing good for others. You know, we don't we don't not like if we have an opportunity to mow someone else's lawn, and we know our neighbor might uh, have had back surgery recently, or just honestly, you know, appreciates it when we have to you know take care of their lawn as well then feel free and do that kind of thing. You know, you you got snow on the ground and you got a snowblower and you decided, hey, I'm just going to, you're not even going to ask for money, though it's a great way to earn money for camp, by the way. But, uh, you know, I'm not even going to ask for money. I'm just going to knock on on Mrs. Maple's door and say, hey, would you, you know, would you like me to snowblow you? I know it's that's pretty... That's pretty thick on your lawn there. Um, absolutely, look for those kind of opportunities. It, again, it kind of boils down, like most of these will, be, focus on how to be a Christian and you'll find those other things they flow from that, right? They, they, they focus on on your relationship with God and, and what you need to be striving to grow in your life. And you'll find that when it comes to relationships with your neighbors and the other people in the world, it'll flow fairly fairly naturally from that. I can't find it. Oh, you can't find it? Okay, I'll look for it. What was, what was it looking for again? About uh, how, oh, even people, yeah. other people have a... Well, there's one close to it. Um, 
having a good conscience, this is First Peter 3.16, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. But that was not exactly it. It's like, you've, like I would argue this was the case with David. When David really started to come on the scene very prominently there in, in 2 Samuel, and he, um, he kills Goliath, and uh, everybody's praising him. The the that section of scripture makes it very clear that David did his conduct was very good and mm-hmm. he behaved in wisdom. And really, you start to realize that means that when Saul begins to hate him at that point because he's a rival, that he had no good cause to do it because his mm-hmm. conduct was good. Like, and I would argue for the whole of the David Saul story that despite all the, all the Saul never giving up and wanting to to take David out because he viewed him as a, as a rival. Um, you he could never really find anything true that he could he could um, accuse David of hmm. because he, he was very wise in, in his now response. I don't know if this is what you're looking for or not but when it comes to advice concerning an elder okay Paul uh, tells Timothy that he needs to consider about this person uh, moreover he must have a good testimony among those who are outside hmm. lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil that's not exactly what you're looking yeah. for is it i've probably made up a scripture in the bible <laughs> well, you know we we know a number we have a number of friends of the podcast out there who are ministers and they're probably yelling at their car stereo right now no uh, exactly that that actually is it's probably the case so feel free feel free let us okay. know and we'll probably get 18 emails yeah. after this about yeah, exactly. it <laughs> okay i think that was good you All right. Hit the oh, third one. Uh, yeah. I. Oh, you know what? I, let me highlight it. Just I won't. Okay. We won't turn to them, but let me say uh, just a few. Uh, just a few more. For instance, uh, in Romans thirteen seven, it talks about giving honor to whom honor is due. Uh, oh wait. I don't know. If the, I hate to go back to it, but I don't think this is it. But in in Titus chapter two. It talks about uh, speaking with sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Oh, that's, that's that close might, to that it. Might yeah, be that, it. that might be uh, it. Okay, okay, maybe, maybe. Okay. Again, someone's thinking, ah, you guys keep missing it, and they're going to send yeah. it in. <laughs> um, but honor to whom honor is due, that's how we relate to others. When we talk about honoring the hoary head, the old, the old language for someone with gray hair, that's not just in the church. If you see an elderly person, regardless of whether they're in the church or not, there should be a matter of respect towards that, you know. Uh, Also, the example of the family that Paul talks about in 1 Timothy chapter 5, that is learning how to deal with older men from how you deal with your father, learning how to deal with older women the way you learn with your mother, the way you, you deal with your peers by the way you deal with your brother and sister. Again, those are life principles. Those are not just simply re- reserved for those in the church. That's for that's how you relate to to everyone. And then finally, the the large pictures I wanted to to get across is, and it and it it rang in my mind when Mr. Robinson was referring to Proverbs. There are there are so many large picture things that are just practical. The Bible is a, an astonishingly practical booklet. I mean, not booklet book. When he was talking about a, a soft answer turns away wrath. That is a universal principle that you apply at any time. And so when you get to, say, the Sermon on the Mount, and you're reading Matthew chapter 5 and chapter 6 and chapter 7, when you get to Romans 12, which is very much a practical Christian living kind of of chapter about being a living sacrifice, focus on those things. Focus on learning what Christ is saying, walk in this way. This is how, yes, we talk about about principles and doctrines, but all that thing turns into how you choose to put one foot in front of the other every day, the things you'll touch with your hands, the things you'll say with your mouth. If you focus on those things, it is inevitable that you will be impacted in terms of how you deal with other people. The, yeah. Those things will give you perspective. It, it's The Bible, again, is a very grounded book. It's a mistake to think of it as some kind of academic book that's just full of, uh, you know, about the nature of God. and these. No, it is really about day-to-day living. Yeah. And if you focus on those things and focus on trying to live that way day-to-day, you'll find that your relationship with people is naturally impacted and shaped in the way that it should be. So could we say, because because you're 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 going through it ha- there just now, made me think of like um, one like if you had to describe it in one way, and to me it would be your 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 overall attitude should be default peacemaker. Like I go through like for example I don't know if this is a great example like in our neighborhood um, when we moved in 
to that house four years ago. Uh, the lawn was kind of going in the wrong direction. And uh, I didn't know that fescue needed seeded every year because down in Texas we don't roll like that. And so it's by the second year, it's terrible because I don't know that you need to put seed on it. And, and it made me concerned because you want to avoid getting on your neighbor's radar and the HOA's radar as having a bad, then they, then they always watch you. And so my goal is always to stay off the radar. And I think that would, that you could apply that in many ways. It's just be fun, easygoing, peacemaker, always have, a, you know, as much as you can have a good balanced attitude that, that in some ways draws no attention. You know, there's, what's the other scripture, uh, be wise as sermons and harmless and doves, you know, yeah, don't, don't be yeah. naive and foolish. Like there's the real world out there yet at the same time, you know, your, your goal is to, to be viewed as largely harmless in some sense. No, you're right. It's, it's not, you're not putting your head down and, and cowering. It's not, it's not, uh, don't be noticed in fear, but if you're just living a warm, kind, good life, then it's usually one, it's usually troublemakers who stand up right and get attention but then if you're focusing on being a good Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, then there will be times here and there when your job in a sense is to be the troublemaker, but not because you're actively deciding mm-hmm. I'm going to cause trouble. You find a lot of people will just, they, they want to cause trouble and they're just going to use God and their faith as an excuse to cause yeah. trouble. Yeah. But there's times when God, like, like the apostles, they didn't go into the temple to cause trouble. They, came, they went to the temple to obey God and preach the gospel. But as a result, they did stand out for that. And so, like, maybe you're in a classroom and, and uh, the teacher just asked everyone, hey, uh, you know, let's do this thing where uh, you've seen those those videos where they have, like, uh, lines and people stand on a line as to how they agree. And then I, people. Well, I've not seen it, but I am familiar with it. Yeah. So you have things like that. And maybe they're doing that with LGBTQ, right? Or, so, you know, kind of principles. And, and next thing you know, you're the only person standing on the line that yeah. doesn't agree with certain yeah. lifestyles. Well, hey, that's that's you're not. Again, you're not cowering. You're not, you're, you're standing for the truth. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, if your behavior up to that point has been where you were kind and people know you as a loving, giving person, all of that testimony, all of a sudden comes to bear and people have a hard time, regardless of what words you're being called, calling you a bigot. Mm-hmm. And, and because now they're wrestling with, here's this person who has been a tremendous, I mean, I, I would want to count this person among my friends the rest of my life. And yet they have this stand the world is telling me is terrible. So you will naturally, your times will be coming as like, I like to say, cause it makes me sound poetic as the sky grows darker, the stars that have always been present will shine that much brighter in, 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 in contradiction to the darkness in that sense. Yes, you will start to stand out, but not because you're just radically looking to stand out. Right. You're just simply right. living right. the faith. And right. then all those times when you have been so peaceable and wonderful to be with, that becomes part of your testimony mm-hmm. that, that who's the bad guy here? It's not me, you know? So yeah. anyway, I don't know if that yeah. fits in Good. with what you're saying. That no, sounds fantastic. All right. The third question, and this is a favorite of, of mine, and that is the question, how do we discern God's will? And let me kind of set up a, a, a situation. So uh, let's say someone, they, they're facing a difficult choice, maybe a change in jobs. And they know on one hand they could get another job doing, I don't know what, just, you know, it's hypothetical, you know, doing something, or they've always been tempted to start their own business. And they think maybe there's an opportunity, you know, is, is God trying to tell me to start my own business now, or is this not the time? And so you have them just struggling. Oh God, I want to know your will, you know, which I've got these two doors in front of me and I want to know which door to go through and how do we discern, you know, God's will, uh, for, for some that can also be in relationships. Oh, how do I know that God wants me to pursue this particular, is this the one that God has chosen for me? That's where I think sometimes we have to be careful because we do believe God is involved in our lives. And I like to think that God helped me find my wife and helped me to be smart enough to recognize, but was it because there was some sort of special sign or something? Mm-hmm. Or like if I'd passed that opportunity as God's going, well, you're an idiot and the rest of your life is ruined. I think it's it's kind of it almost turns God into some kind of a, I don't even know like a a magical token that you've got to do all the right steps like a some sort of weird spell in a Hollywood movie to make things turn out. This idea of discerning God's will, 
well, let me get the positive side of that. We all want to be within God's will, right? We all, we all want to know that God is pleased with the choices we're making. So I'm not trying to mock that general idea, but rather, what does it mean then? How do we discern what that will is? Yeah. And you, you had, you had an interesting insight uh, suggestion in terms of how sometimes that looking for God's will manifests its, itself. Yeah. You know, but before I, before you hopefully that? I'll lead into that. I was okay. thinking about, you know, you're right. You and I have had this discussion a lot because, well, so one, I think this is actually one of the most difficult things to find the right balance on. It's determining, it's just hard. Yeah. Even though I feel like I'm better at it, I still feel, feel like, especially things that are very difficult, you're like, it's just hard to tell. It's, it's, it's easy for us to be over interpretive of signs, which I'll, I'll mention that more in a, in a minute. But, but the other thing like you and I talked about is like, sometimes it's easier for, for us to fall into a mentality where if I kind of check off all the boxes, if I read all the right things and, and go through the, all the right processes that I, that there's a predictable outcome. Right. Now we can certainly get much closer to an outcome that we would expect by, by doing the right thing. So that even that requires kind of a, a balance on it, but like, you know, don't, don't get discouraged if you, if you did X, Y, and Z and did all these things and then you don't get the result that you expected because, oh, wow, there's just no guarantee. Okay. I didn't think about that, Mr. Robinson. I have a verse for that. Okay. Um, well, so, okay. Well, let, well then you, let me mention this other part and then you will come back to that. Does that sound good? Or do you want to hit it now? Oh, you know what? It might, it might given, okay, because I didn't know you're going to go in that direction. And, uh, you, we do notes ahead of time. We don't plan every detail. Y'all are getting a conversation and let me, you let me know. Okay. In, fa- in fact, if, if it was a mistake and I should do it later, then let me know. And, we'll just and you guys will never know listening. <laughs> we'll just, we'll just fix it. But, um, th- that idea, because this came up a, a long time ago, uh, in a question from a young person, actually it was a decade, more than a decade ago, but it was actually from a young adult who saw Ecclesiastes nine verse 11 and or, or if they didn't, their question related to this. And Solomon is making a point, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11. And this is where he's doing all his philosophizing, and he's he's kind of done all sorts of things in his life, but God has miraculously kept his wisdom intact so he could think about it. And it says in verse 11, I returned and saw under the sun that is in this world, this life that we live, he saw the following. The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. Well, some have said, well, yeah, but that, that, but that doesn't happen to us, right? That doesn't, you know, because God is, is, we're not, well, it depends on what you mean. Yes, God is involved in our lives, but if we truly are the fastest in a race, and, and, and we have a relationship with God, you know, he's maybe we've even baptized, he's dwelling in us. Is that guarantee we're going to win that race? Right. Is it right. guarantee we're not going to trip and, and, and scrape our knee or that something completely out of our control, something like part of the track isn't, isn't properly like there's a scuff in it or something. No, don't, don't get too overly abstract about this. The fact is you can do all the right things and sometimes things don't turn out the way that they, you know, they really should. Does that mean you did the wrong thing? Mm -hmm. Does that mean you should have trained harder? Is it possible to train such that there's nothing that could ever happen on the field where you will lose the game or fail to catch the ball? Well, no, the difference it makes is that it doesn't happen apart from God. That is God is aware. God is involved. He's not surprised. You know, he's not like, Oh no, I did not intend for Wallace Smith to lose this race. Oh, what am I going to do? No, he's involved. And if he's allowed that circumstance to take place is because he sees it as fitting in his plan and he's going to work with us even in that circumstance. So it's a, it's, I think it does relate to what you're saying because it's this idea, well, I thought it was God's will for me to be in this race. It's like, well, now you're getting all disillusioned instead of just, well, the things we're going to talk about. Getting caught up in our own expectation of what the results should be. I think a great example of that is Joseph in Joseph's life. Oh man. Good example. young, Young Joseph is thrown into a pit. He was a little full of himself, so you could argue he, he was. He had that coming, but you know, he sold into slavery, which he definitely didn't deserve. But 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 then he gets into Potiphar's house, and he does the right thing. You know, and Potiphar's wife wants to yep. commit adultery yep. with him, and here he's not being full of himself. He's saying, "No, he's going to honor his master and honor God by not doing that." 
And then what happens? He gets he gets thrown into prison, railroaded. For, what what right. for potentially ten years? That's right. It, it's it's not it's not a few months. He he, you know what? He'd be on a list on the internet. It's like one guy said in a TV show I watched recently. He'd be on one of those web pages people look at before they buy a house in the area. You know, because here he tried to quote unquote sexually assault when it was all made up. It was all yeah. false charges for a decade or so. I mean, and yeah, yeah, astonishing. So poor young um, Joseph, who's doing the best he can, and he is mindful of God's law and he is keeping it and his reward was going into prison for eight or nine years. But you know, you read the whole rest of the story and you understand he's in his own words. He understands why he had to go through that process and, and well, why. you couldn't have picked a better example. I think Mr. Robinson, thank you for that because right. it, it boils into, it comes down to the point that I, that I try to make with this is if you want to discern God's will, then seek to follow his commands Simply ask for his guidance and try to make right decisions mm-hmm. based on the circumstance. Yep. Don't don't try to divine something. That that's what the that's what the heathen would do. They would they would you know cut up a chicken and yeah. spread its guts out on a table and look at the guts Listen, to try to determine what they're supposed to do. You are not exaggerating. Like I I thought that the. I wonder if that was, been, that was big thunder. <laughs> I wonder if y'all can even hear this on the microphone. We got some fantastic thunder outside. So when, when the Persians were attacking the Greeks and, and the Spartans and the, the, the Persians have a mighty, mighty army. They, they by far outnumber the Greeks and the, and the, and the, um, and, and their allies. And by the way, they were not all loyal to each other. The Greeks were all over the place, but I just, just blew me away. The Persians who had the, the, the most extensive archery at the time, just throwing arrows onto the Spartans. Hmm who cannot decide if they should attack or hold still. Mm. And they, not an exaggeration, whoever's in charge of this kind of thing, they're literally having arrows raining down on them. And they're like going through guts of animals to determine determine if they need to attack or if they should retreat or whatever. I mean, it was entirely the God's wills, if you will. And they're just looking for signs. But somebody else who was not the Spartans got tired of waiting on them and they started to attack. And (laughs) for some reason, the Persians could not ever defeat the the Greek heavy infantry. And they'll, you know, so anyway, that's a whole other podcast. But thank you. I appreciate your your comment on that. And the the thing I was going to say is my mom's saying, and I may not get it entirely right. She says, but she said, once a decision is made, all signs point to yes. Interesting. And what she means by that is once we've, we feel like whether it's subconsciously or consciously, we've made a tough decision. Then from that point on, our tendency is to view everything as a sign supporting the decision mm. we've already made. Mm. And so one of the things I've seen people fall into, I would argue that I have done this myself is words were so at times so desperate for a, some kind of sign from God about the direction we would, we go that we start viewing everything that goes on around us through that prism. And then we start discerning signs that aren't really there. And that is not that I would say, do you tell me if you agree with this? I would say like 98% of the time discerning God's will is not by interpreting signs. Oh, I, absolutely. I, I think what it made me think of uh, something you said earlier, and this too, is what, first, ignore today. Think of the millennium. Think of the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, and imagine now you're glorified, and you're you're serving under Christ. You're serving ten cities, five cities, whatever the case is. But and 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 someone on the earth who is seeking to learn God's way now, they come to you as a member of the God family, and they're trying to make a decision. They're trying to do not just the right thing, but the wise thing, you know, they're, they're looking to, that's everything you want. And so that, that would be a part of your life for a thousand years. What is what you're going to do? Just constantly say, uh, yeah, do this, go do that. Yeah. Go do this. Uh, it, it, hard decision. Let me just tell you the answer. Yeah. No, right. You're going to be guiding them to highlight for them. You know, here's the principles you want to keep in mind. You want to balance this one principle definitely recommends this with this other. And here's how you balance those things. And you're going to want to help them mm-hmm. learn to make those decisions. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what we should expect Christ to do with us today. He's not there just waiting. Well, I can't wait for you to ask me so I can show a giant blinker like the back of a car telling you to go left instead of right. 
No, what we want to ask him is, well, God, help me see those principles. Help me the, to, to know, you know, what is what is the right call to make here, and what's it going to do? He's going to he's going to want us weighing his commands, his mind, his desire, and trying to do the wise thing based on those, the things that would please him most. So it, I try to put it this way. If instead of looking for a sign, which is what it's just too tempting to want to do, it's the, I'd say the laziest thing to do to a certain extent. You just, you just don't want to figure it out. I'm going to say don't want, you're, you're desperate. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to put people down because often they're in very desperate circumstances. Yeah. And, yeah. and there's yeah. nothing wrong with yeah. asking God in his mercy to and, make it as obvious as genuinely possible. Are like, I do not know what to do here. Yeah. <laughs> Was it Mr. Burson? So you, I don't know if you ever met Mr. David no, I Burson. I, I, I miss him very much, but he, he used to say, you know, it is okay to ask God for a gimme here and there, you know, say, God, look, <laughs> and I've done it occasionally. Like, look, God, I just, if you could make it as obvious as possible to a goofball like me, I'd appreciate it. And, and sometimes he has other times. Nope. I still got to yep. go through the process of figuring it out. And if you're taking the time to figure it out by weighing the facts, looking at the principles that God gives you and striving to make the kind of decision you think Jesus Christ would, let me, let me ask you if God is in heaven, which he is, and if he's watching you, which he is, is he going to think, oh, I, I sent him all these signs and instead he's got his nose in my Bible and he's trying to figure out what I would want him to do. Arg, I am so frustrated with my, mm -hmm. my son or daughter. No, of course he's not. You're doing exactly what he wants you to do, where you're doing the hard work of trying to figure out what the wise and right thing to do is. And so that let's say you just go ahead and continue fantasizing. Let's say you do your best and you're weighing these principles and God, you know, is you're going in a particular direction. Well, is God going to think, well, you know, actually if he'd gone this other direction, I planned on doing this and this, but I guess I'm powerless up in heaven. Yeah. No, God, <laughs> if you're trying to seek God's will by trying to do the right thing, by trying to look at the principles that God gives you, looking at his commands, looking at his laws, praying about it, that is the exact environment where he can work with you and shape the direction that you're going. And and that's, that's without making you look at goat uh, gizzards, I guess goats don't have gizzards, you know, to try to figure out which direction you should go. Rather, you let him guide you through his word in the Bible, the principles that apply, the commands you have to keep in mind. And you're in, you're very much in the right space to be guided by him if you're seeking to do those yeah. things. I would say in general, the principle I found the most helpful is surprise from the Bible. <laughs> and, you know, this is something Mr. Ames sometimes emphasizes or, or has in the past. And it's the idea of ask, seek, and knock. Now, if you go look at Matthew 7, 7 and read it, um, the, my, my following formula, if you will, is a little bit of an oversimplification. Um, there's a more going on there than just this. But the, the principle of ask, seek, knock, like you, you are seeking God's will, right? So you ask God what you should do. You, you seek in terms of like, so you're out there looking for a solution, you find a door and you knock on it. Now, and, and, and there it says to him who knocks it will be opened. But also, a lot of the way you discern God's will is actually closed doors. There's been plenty of time. I, I'll give you one example. Um, in my old profession, which was primarily printing, not, not exclusive, but I was concerned about the future of print. I was right, by the way. And, you know, the, 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 the internet was extremely disruptive and was going to disrupt something like the print industry, which it did, but never once was a door open to me to move my career fully into the, the, the web realm. Hmm. And then, you know, and this was for years, for years, this went on and it just never worked. And I would keep looking, I would keep knocking on the door and it was just, and then one day a very different door opened up and I went off in a direction basically being here at headquarters that was exactly what I'd always been doing that I was good at. And there's still some overlap with the web stuff, but, um, there's a lot of times in my life that I really want it to be a certain way, but the doors are not opening. And I think the key is to not force the door open because you and I have both seen people that don't take no for an answer and they just keep shoving their will and they, bur they break down the door practically in one sense. And yeah. so, you know, um, be careful what you wish for, right? <laughs> and and so when we force our will, sometimes God lets you have it, and that's not that's not a good thing. 
generally speaking. Um, but at the same time, sometimes, you know, we talk about signs, yet at the same time, you can go, this door opened, and then this door opened, and this door opened, and you just you just walk through the doors. So oversimplification, but I, I have found genuinely, um, don't look for signs like the ones we talked about earlier, but asking God and, and keeping your eyes open and being aware of maybe some potential avenues of how to solve your problem or how to move forward. And, and then when you're investigating these things, if the door's not opening, don't, don't bust it down, you know, right. don't break it down. Um, wait until there's some open doors. Cause I found in general, when a door opens, man, it's, it's generally fairly obvious, especially if it's a series of doors. Right. And it's going to be a door that doesn't contradict God's principles and his guidance and his commandments. It's like, oh, the door's open now, but well, I got to go through a few sins to get through that door. <laughs> but no, the, the, that's another way to indicate that it's actually closed. There is a sermon that Mr. Jonathan McNair gave relatively recently here in Charlotte, so it would not so be up the, on the website yet. About the discerning the mind of God. Yeah. Or his will. His yeah, will. actually. Yeah. yeah. So if, uh, you know, whenever that comes out, maybe cause we're going to put this yeah. up on the living I've heard very website. Positive things about it. we were out of town. Oh yeah. You know what? I remember you were out of town. I think we we're meeting in that alternate location and regardless. Yeah. What, uh, I see that come out. I might go back and, and post that on the living uh, webpage, but Miss Robinson, well, sure enough, we pulled it off. It's been an hour and we did not get to know. No. However, this is not the last one of these. We, we have a host of questions, yep. and so we'll come back and, and do some more of that these. Sounds good. We sure appreciate all of you and your contributions, and we hope, we hope these few answers have been helpful.